Okay, so I'm going back now to the lecture for Monday, the 21st of October. Welcome to the web portion of that lecture, and apologies that I didn't time things better. We're going to talk in this portion of the lecture about Polanyi. Now, get back to the Great Transformation, which you're reading for Tuesday's seminars. As I mentioned last time, Polanyi had the project of tracing the institutional mechanisms of the downfall of a civilization, and that his project unfolded in three phases. Last week, we talked about the rise of a self-regulating market governed by prices. Today's lecture, we talked about an example of self-regulation in the form of the gold standard adjustment mechanism, self-regulation in the sense that nobody is actively making the market work out that way. It ought to be automatic if things work as planned in any event. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the protective reaction to the self-regulating market and why, in Polanyi's view, there, this protective re reaction had such dire consequences. Polanyi's account is organized around something he calls the double movement. And here is one of the clearest formulations from the book of the double movement. The double movement can be personified as the action of two organizing principles in society. The first of these, the principle of economic liberalism, aiming at the establishment of a self-regulating market, relying on the support of the trading classes and using largely laissez-faire and free trade as its methods. And then the second principle was the principle of social protection, which aimed to conserve man and nature as well as productive organization, which relied on the varying support of those most immediately affected by the deleterious action of the market, primarily but not exclusively the working in the landed classes and using protective legislation, restrictive associations, and other instruments of intervention as its methods. Polanyi hopes to organize this discussion of the double movement around his three fictitious commodities. A commodity, as we recall from last time, is something produced for sale. He thinks that this is not true of land, labor, or money. But in fact, the role in the book is more complicated than this summary suggests. The fictitious commodities serve to motivate the double movement, and they encapsulate Polanyi's belief in a fabric of society that could potentially be shredded, and the class structure of society. So let's look at how that happens. If we go back to the statement of the double movement that I gave you before, you can see that these notions of class structure and the fabric of society are important to Polanyi. He talks about what is the class basis of the establishment of a self-regulating market. He says it relies on the trading classes. Um, and then he talks about what is the class basis of the productive protective reaction, and he talks about the working and landed classes. So I have here a class structure in bold, the working and landed classes as primarily responsible for the protective counter-movement, the trading classes primarily responsible for pushing economic liberalism. What is it that the protective impulse was trying to protect? Well, here, I think the right way to say it, and he says it this way at various points in the book, is that the, the fabric of society, what he means by the fabric of society will become clearer, but basically the social structures and patterns of ongoing social interaction that are necessary for society to persist. So he's talking about the class structure, how the class structure intersects with efforts to either promote a self-regulating market or to protect the fabric of society. And in effect, what he does in the book is to combine the fictitious commodities with this argument about class structure and the social fabric, and he gives each um, 
of the three fictitious commodities some connection to the fabric of society, which she also sometimes calls general human interest, and some connection to class structure. So land, the fictitious commodity, is associated with the natural environment, but also local community. And the relevant part of the class structure he talks about is the landed classes, which she means both landlords and peasants. And most of the section on the double movement, he's not very specific about uh, which of these he might mean. Labor, he associates with the general human interests in social status, dignity, and humane working conditions. Without these things, society doesn't persist. They're part of the fabric of society, and the associated class that depends, defends these things is the working class. And finally, money is associated with productive organizations, or what are sometimes known as going concerns, businesses that exist to make a profit. And when the monetary system is undermining the capacity of businesses to do that, capitalists, employers, employers and financiers, or the trading classes work to ensure some sort of protective reaction. So each class in this theory defends its corresponding piece of the social fabric. But, and this is really important, success derives from broad support. I haven't had you read the portion of the book in which he makes this argument, but his is not an argument solely about class struggle. It's also about the capacity of classes to achieve their political aims, which he believes fundamentally rests on their ability to draw other classes into seeing that they are defending a fundamental social interest. So the success derives from broad support. So the fictitious commodities, the key, the reason I think that Polanyi groups things in the way he does around the fictitious commodities is that they allow him to summarize the notion of a fabric of society. They allow him to summarize the class structure of society, but also, and very important, these three things are also potential loci, potential sites of interference with the gold standard adjustment mechanism and the self-regulating market more generally. So how does that bit work? Well, Polanyi has a second formulation of the double movement, according to which... It consists first in the extension of the principle of the self-regulating market to genuine commodities, and then second, its restriction, the restriction of that self-regulating market principle with respect to the fictitious commodities. And if we go through the three fictitious commodities, we can see that he has some restrictions in mind. So with respect to land, for instance, he says that um, you get trade barriers are a form of restriction. Now, you might immediately say, well, the trade barriers that he's talking about, trade barriers, for instance, on agricultural commodities, are not really restrictions on the purchase and sale of land. And I think that that's true. He's uh, a little bit... Uh, sliding from one thing to another. Nonetheless, he is making the point that one of the things that the gold standard adjustment mechanism presumes is free trade, and one might get instead trade barriers. In the various episodes in the late 19th century in which there's some of this. Then another way that one might interfere with the gold standard adjustment mechanism is by introducing forms of nominal rigidity. As we talked about before, the gold standard adjustment mechanism requires prices to be able to sink when there's a gold outflow. But if prices can't sink, then one doesn't get adjustment. So labor, as a force that's committed to maintaining its nominal wages is going to resist the sinking uh, sinking prices for its labor. It's going to resist sinking wages. is going to contribute to pr price rigidity. 
And then, with respect to the final fictitious commodity, money, it doesn't really talk again about restrictions on its purchases and sale, which is kind of what you would think he meant based on the description of the double moon on the preceding slide. Instead, he talks about the effort by central banks to manage the price level and to minimize or avoid deflation. What Polanyi has to say about this in the book can be a bit hard to read. I've put on the Moodle page a, a summary of how I think he understands monetary policy by central banks in the gold standard era that may help with that. Now, it's not just that Polanyi thinks that the double movement happens, that the social fabric is defended via political action of classes that has the effect of interfering with various aspects of the gold standard adjustment mechanism. That's what the double movement is. But this, it is not only significant that it happens, but also the effect it has on the capacity of the self-regulating market to continue. So Polanyi says it was vital that the counter-movement against huge fluctuations in prices that shredded the social fabric took place. This was vital for the protection of society. On the other hand, it was also something that interfered with the self-regulation of the market and thus with the market system itself. So let's see how Polanyi understands the form of that interference. We have here the double movement drawn as a causal mechanism diagram. Markets threaten the fabric of society. You get a class-led protective response, interference with the gold standard adjustment mechanism. What does that mean? Do? Well, let's see what happens if the gold standard adjustment mechanism isn't functioning as it's supposed to. Let's start up here. If there's no adjustment of trade imbalances, the consequence of that is that states with a trade deficit need to borrow money to finance their imports. So if they're borrowing money, they accumulate debts. Another thing that happens when the gold standard adjustment mechanism isn't working is that when wages are above competitive levels, we were discussing at the end of the actually presented lecture today, when wages are above competitive levels, you tend to get a rise in unemployment and in a set of circumstances where labor tries to preserve its income, you tend to get unemployment payouts. So the whole system of unemployment insurance is, in Polanyi's view, a necessary part of the counter-movement against markets, but in circumstances when unemployment rises, this leads to an accumulation of debt in states with a tr trade deficit. So, all of this means that if the gold standard adjustment mechanism isn't working, there needs to be some way of financing debts on the part of some states. If, for some reason, international lending collapses, and this is what happens after the financial crisis in 1929, is that international lending collapses. A lot of the international lending was coming from the United States, as we've already seen. The United States was suffering bank failures and a lot of monetary disarray. So international lending collapses after 1929, and this leads to pressure for austerity. It leads the states that with these accumulated debts to try to find ways to pay them back. Since they can't refinance the debt, they can't borrow anymore, they try to pay the debts back by cutting spending. If they're going to cut spending, they would have, for instance, to cut on unemployment insurance. These pressures for austerity that ensue when the debts that must be accumulated if the gold standard adjustment mechanism isn't operating, 
These pressures for austerity lead, in Polanyi's view, or can lead to a dangerous political stalemate. Market liberal policy in the face of unsustainable trade deficits is to say we need to maintain free trade, we need to contract the money supply as the gold standard adjustment mechanism s suggests to get prices down, we need to get the wage level to drop, and we need to implement austerity in government spending. But this gives rise to a protective counter move. You get labor strikes, such as the 1926 general strike in the UK, power of left-wing parties more generally, you get unemployment insurance, you get trade protectionism, and you get replacement of gold reserves by other means. In other words, all sorts of efforts to keep the gold standard adjustment mechanism from operating. In Polanyi's view, it is often the case that these two impulses, the market liberal impulse and the protective counter move in the late 1920s, early 1930s, fought themselves to a stalemate, leading to one of two outcomes. One is political upheaval, fascism, and other forms of the eclipse of democracy. Polanyi goes through this political experience pretty quickly, but one of the cases he clearly has in mind, in the back of his mind, or maybe in the forefront of his mind, but he doesn't set out quite so clearly on the page, is the case of Germany. Germany had lots of debt coming into the 1930s. One of the reasons it had lots of debt was because it had war reparations it was supposed to be paying back from World War I. You can read about this part of the story in the selection from Patel f that I've given for this week. In 1931, they suffer a, Germany suffers a bank crisis, having trouble getting international finance, and after Great Britain devalues its currency in September of 1931, Germany is faced with a serious dilemma. It could try to devalue its currency too, for reasons I'll talk about in a minute, it chooses not to do that, and instead, the Chancellor of Germany, at the time Chancellor Brunning, passes a decree saying all wages will go down by a certain amount. Somebody asked me in class today about how uh, wages were reduced. In the German case, there was this direct effort to use a decree, a mechanism that bypassed the parliament to force down wages. So Polanyi summarizes all of this sort of thing by saying the deflationist ideal came to be a free economy under a strong government, but while the phrase on government meant what it said, namely emergency powers and suspension of public liberties, free economy meant in practice just the opposite of what it said, namely governmentally adjusted prices and wages, though the adjustment was made with the express purpose of restoring the freedom of the exchanges, which means unrestricted conversion of domestic currency to gold or international currency and free international markets. In the course of these vain deflationary efforts, free markets had not been restored, though free governments had been sacrificed. So what Polanyi says, if we look at the political program of somebody like Chancellor Brunin in Germany, who's the last, uh, you know, the last episode of relatively democratic government <coughs> in Germany before Hitler comes to power in 1933, we can see the effect of efforts to uphold the model of economic liberalism to reimpose the gold standard adjustment mechanism, and those efforts were fundamentally hostile to the protective counter move and to democracy. So free markets are not restored, but free governments are sacrificed. And we get then to the institutional mechanisms of the downfall of a civilization. Polanyi's charted the whole thing out. 
first part of the double movement, markets threaten the fabric of society. You get a class-led protective response. This um, has the effect in the interwar period of interference with the gold standard adjustment mechanism. It leads to a catastrophic stalemate when workers won't accept lower wages. Governments try to, to force them to do so, and it has anti-democratic effects, and ultimately contributes to the rise of fascism and leads to the catastrophe of World War II. Now, you might look at the, all of this and say, well, if the gold standard was having such tremendously damaging consequences, why did countries hold on to it so long? And indeed, that was the other possibility, that in those countries where the gold standard was abandoned, one didn't get this catastrophic stalemate, and one didn't wind up with the fascist outcome, when it, at least when the gold standard was abandoned soon enough. So why wasn't it abandoned? Well, economic reasons were an important part of it. For many countries, uh, it was tantamount to dropping out of the international economy. And also for political reasons. This is an important claim of Polanyi's, which you might try to evaluate, that financiers recognized that there was an ever-present threat of panic associated with the gold standard. Why? Because the gold standard was a promise to convert paper money into gold. Gold reserves were not 100%, so just like a case with a bank run, if people think that a paper currency is not going to be convertible to gold anymore, people will rush to convert it to gold as soon as they can. That threat of currency panic, which is a threat that always hangs over the gold standard, in Polanyi's view, was recognized as a political weapon by capitalists, by what he called the trading classes, by owners and the rich more generally. And in Polanyi's view, those forces were very reluctant to give up the gold standard, not so much because of what it meant about prices and so on, but especially because without the threat of currency panic, no one would have to listen to their views on economic policy. So P Polanyi suggests that under the gold standard, the leaders of the financial market are entrusted in the nature of things with the safeguarding of stable exchanges and sound internal credit on which government finance largely depends. The banking organization is the same thing, the leaders of the financial market means the banking organization means the same thing by that, is thus in the position to obstruct any domestic move in the economic sphere which it happens to dislike, whether its reasons are good or bad. You can't do X, Polanyi is suggesting that the financial leaders say to governments, you can't do X because if you do, there will be a currency panic. In terms of politics, on currency and credit government, and on currency and credit, governments must take the advice of the bankers, who alone can know whether any financial measure would or would not endanger the capital market and the exchanges, meaning, the, again, the exchanges means the exchange rate. The financial market governs by panic. You can read more about this argument in a paper of mine that I've put in the further reading, where I summarize Polanyi's views on this in some detail. All right, so what we've had is a summary of Polanyi's institutional mechanisms for the downfall of civilization. What you need to understand is how, in Polanyi's view, the failure to allow the gold standard adjustment mechanism to operate emerged naturally out of the efforts of classes to defend portions of the social fabric, to defend society from the effects of deflation, from the effects of the gold standard adjustment mechanism operating without any interference. In Polanyi's view, that 
effort or that stalemate between forces interfering with the gold standard adjustment mechanism and those trying to force it to operate had catastrophic political effects. All right. In the 1930s, after a period varies from country to country in which the Great Depression worsens, eventually, starting from around 1933, one gets a recovery. And one gets a recovery above all because the gold standard stops functioning and that allows governments much more autonomy in how they conduct their policy. This is especially true in the United States. In March of 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt comes to power in the U.S., becomes the President of the United States, institutes a set of policies that is known as the New Deal. A very important part of these was, in effect, to abandon the gold standard. There's it was rather complicated how he did it. There's a lot of detail to this story. But from his very first days as president, he made sure that the gold standard no longer served as a constraint on what American monetary policy could be. And he adopted an explicit policy, which I've given a quote summarizing it here, but this policy goes back to the first days of his administration, even though this particular quote is from October 1933. The definite policy of the government has to been to restore commodity price levels. So he's trying to get prices to go up because they've been falling. The object has been the attainment of such a le level as will enable agricultural and industry once more to give work to the unemployed. It has been to make possible the payment of public and private debts more nearly at the price level at which they were incurred. So trying to get prices up as a way of making debts more payable, as a way of restarting the economy and overcoming the effects of deflation. The dollar does go back on the gold standard from January of 1934, but at a much lower level, and gold inflows at that point drive, help to drive expansions in monetary policy and price rises through the rest of the decade. Again, this is a very intricate story, which I'm summarizing in broad brush here. So you can really see the effect of FDR is taking office um, on the macroeconomic variables we looked at before. Things start to turn around as soon as he takes office. There are competing views on why this happens, which I'll talk a little bit about next week. But part of the story is that if everybody expects in the economy things to go badly, things will go badly, FDR's election changed expectations about what was going to happen in the economy, and that made a big difference. All right. The other thing that may or may not have made a big difference was government spending. Not So we've been talking so far almost exclusively about monetary policy, about things that governments or central banks do to affect how easy it is to borrow money and to create money, but another thing that governments might do to try to turn an economy around is demand stimulus. You remember Bloch's discussion, the macroeconomic regulation state, demand stimulus was part of it. We're going to talk about that issue in detail next week. How important that was in overcoming the Great Depression is a matter of some controversy, but what nobody disagrees with is that the theory of demand stimulus was worked out in response to the Great Depression, and so studying it in that context helps us to understand why it has the form it does. All right, apologies again for not getting through all my slides today, but I hope that the time in the lecture hall was well used in terms of getting you, giving you a chance to understand how money and banking worked, and that you'll forgive me for this extra bit of lecture on Monday evening. All right, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Bye.